It's our joy this morning to hear from different ones from our fellowship, and Taryn and Shanista Anderson have been a part of uh, WE for several years. Taryn is a part of the executive board for WE, and they pastor Life Church in McAllister, Oklahoma, a church plant of how many years now? 21 years ago. And in McAllister, Oklahoma, my, how God has blessed that work in a tremendous way. Uh, I love this couple, love the, what they bring uh, to this fellowship, and uh, so much, so much I could say right there. But it is an honor this morning to have Taryn come and share the word with us. Are you ready to receive the word today? Amen, amen. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, Pastor Steve. What an honor to be able to stand here and uh, to be able to bring a word and to just hopefully share something. I mean, what do you preach to preachers, right? But um, thank you, and uh, I appreciate that. I also want to just say, I don't know if Pastor Ryan will see this or not, but if you do, just know your team is amazing, and we just thank Antioch for all they're doing. Come on. Um, it, is, it is an honor to be here. I'm honored to have my wife with me. Uh, she doesn't always get to attend these, but she is the life of the party, and she is here today. So if you'll give Shanista a hand, I'm thankful she's with me this morning. Uh, I'm going to do the obligor- obligatory, that word, picture of the family. Go ahead. Let's put that up there. This was last minute, and I appreciate the team putting this on here. This is, uh, I thought I saw it. Did y'all see that? There we go. Uh, This was vacation, so we were definitely filled with play and fun, and I'm thankful for that. But that is my daughter, Gabby, on the front. She is 19, thinking she's running the world, but she is going to God's school, the Oklahoma Sooners. Thank God for that. Um, And then that is my uh, man-child son back behind me who has passed me up in height and shoe size, size 14. Pray for me. He will be a freshman in high school. Uh, He is a talented musician and just a gift to our family, and um, I'm honored for that group right there. So uh, this morning, I will be quick uh, as I can be, and um, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes on the thought of stop begging and start being. Stop begging and start being. In November of 2020, my mom's dad, my grandfather, passed away at the age of 91 years young, and uh, was just an incredible man in my life, and a a gardener, a hunter, a raiser of beagles, and everything to do with dirt and Big Smith overalls, and I just love it. And um, that was just a part of my life, a part of my DNA and my heritage. But this past June, my mom gave me a gift that was his, and it was this ring. This ring was my grandfather's, and I have the privilege now of every day wearing this symbol of him, of who he is. And it may not be worth much as far as money, but to me it's worth everything because it represents him. It represents who he is. He represents my life, my DNA. It, 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 it's an honor to be able to carry it and wear it and just know that I'm carrying on something that was his. And as I was thinking about that and preparing for this day with you, I was immediately taken to uh, Luke 15 to a story that probably every single one of us in here have preached, and that is the story of the prodigal son. As we know, a father who had two boys, one boy never caused an ounce of trouble, and the second decided, Dad, I want to take my inheritance, and I want to go out, and I want to live my life. And isn't it really interesting that the dad said, okay? Most of us would probably say no, but the dad said, okay. Okay. Gave the son his inheritance. The son goes out and begins to live his life surrounded with friends, the life of the party, invited to everything because he had the money. He had the fun. And so there he was living his best life. And then the Bible says a famine comes. His money runs out. His friends run away. And he's alone. And here now is this Jewish boy sitting in a pig pen, the forbidden animal, to even partake of, and he longs to fill his stomach with what a pig would eat. 
And I think it's really interesting, and I know you know this story, so I don't want to uh, say you know, too much about it. But if you go with me to Luke 15, verse 17, Jesus is speaking this parable. And I love that he says, but when he, the boy, finally came to his senses. <laughs> Have you ever had that moment? He said to himself, at home, the hired servants have enough food to spare, and here I am dying of hunger, so I will go home to my father, and here's what I'm going to say. Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Verse 20, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, he began the speech, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Pretty cool, huh? You know what I love about this was the son had prepared his speech to beg the father for a servant's position. And what did the father do? He ignored the speech and called his identity back to him. Here's your ring. Here's your robe. Here's your shoes. He had given his son his inheritance, but he said, but still what is mine is yours. Mm, I like that. I love that the dad ran to him. Recently, I was reading in a book where there was a reason possibly that the father ran to his son as he was coming back. Because we know that he watched his son go away to where he could no longer see his image going down the road. And now every day as he would watch and look for his son to come back and day in, the day would end without seeing the son. One day, all of a sudden, he notices an image that looks similar to the boy he had raised coming back down the road. And as I was reading in this book, this book book was saying that it could have possibly been because of Deuteronomy 21 where the rebellious sons at the time would be taken outside the city gates and actually stoned to death. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I thought that was interesting. And so the father knew possibly if the city official saw his son coming back down this road that there was potentially the opportunity for them to begin picking up stones. And he was thinking, not my boy, not today. You're not going to, because how many of you know the city knows all the gossip? Amen. And so here they are. The father begins to see his son coming down the road. And what does the father do? The father doesn't wait for the son to get to him and beg for his forgiveness and plead for it. No, the father runs to him and begins to throw his identity back on him so that what the officials of the city might would try to put upon him would not be allowed because now he was covered back in who he always was. For the son never stopped being the father's. Not my boy. And so here he was in front of his son. And don't you know he could hear his son and he knew the city officials might be able to hear his son saying, hey, I've sinned, I've messed up, I beg. And don't you know that father was in his ear going, shh, you're covered. Come on, we're going to have a party. Shh, stop begging, son. Start being. Stop begging for me to love you and start being what I've always been for you. Hmm. I can't speak for your experience, but I can speak for mine. I've been that boy, and I've grown up in church experiences where I, I personally felt I was uh, really educated on the ability to beg God to do something in my life. I mean, we, we begged God. We begged God for grace. I'm so unworthy. Please, 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 please. How many of you have ever said please to God? 
We begged God for hope. We begged God for joy. We begged God for a healing. We begged God for freedom. We begged God for any and everything. And and, then this morning we had the most beautiful prayer time right down here. And what I loved about this prayer time that we had down here, not one time did we beg God for anything. We just thanked him for everything that was already ours. But I can remember in youth group days, our youth pastor would call us into a separate room beside the auditorium. And he would say, we got to pray and we got to ask for the spirit. Spirit to come, because if the Spirit doesn't come, we're not going to be able to have church. And I thought, my goodness, I, Lord, please don't let the Spirit not come because I'm in the room. But you know what? I think we've got to remember. We know the Spirit has come, but do you find anywhere in the Bible where God took it back? Doesn't the Scripture tell us He's an omnipresent God? Doesn't the scripture tell us, where can I go from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Wherever I go, you are already there. And then, as we're going to find, we know that, that the Spirit comes to dwell on the inside of us. So guess what? The Spirit of God was already in this room before we got here. And the Spirit of God walked into this room when you walked into it. And He is already here, already doing, already moving. He's already met you at the gate to give you everything you need. So don't beg. Just be. Look at your neighbor and tell him, stop begging. And don't get me wrong, I'm not downplaying prayer meetings. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. There's nothing wrong with praying and getting together to pray. But it, as a young adult, as a middle-aged adult, and now even as a pastor, I begged forever. I tell you as pastors and ministers, I'm guilty of teaching a begging gospel. I've taught my people. We're 21 years old. And now at 21, there's a shift taking place because I'm like, what on earth have I taught these people to beg instead of just being who they always were? I taught them how to be the son instead of receiving what the father had already given them. And the Lord has convicted my heart. And I, I, I taught, I was telling the church Sunday, and, there, and I said, you know, what changed in you, Taryn? And this is what changed in me. Isn't it interesting how scripture will change you? Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14. Look at this scripture right here. New King James, it says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed. With the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of your inheritance. He's the guarantee of your inheritance. Now, the Holy Spirit of promise. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, we know Jesus, he told his disciples, he said to them once when they were eating together, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he what? promised, the promise, the inheritance, as I told you before. Now, this is the same Jesus we know that had many encounters as he was doing his earthly ministry. He would go and he would heal people. But one day we read in Mark chapter 10, where he is walking along the road and he encounters a blind what? Beggar. A blind beggar. The blind beggar saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Because he had found out Jesus was passing by. There was a commotion going on in the streets that day. And people tried to tell him, be quiet. Shh, you're interrupting. And Jesus heard him. And I love what Jesus said to him. Look what Jesus said in Mark 10, 51 through 52. He said, what do you want me to do for you? And Jesus said, and then he said, my rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, look at this word right here. Go, for you begged your way into healing. No. Go, for you have proven you are not worthy enough. Now I will bless you. No. He said, go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly, the man could see. Why? His faith in him. 
We know the promise comes at Pentecost. The church is born on that special day. And then we realize also that one of the first ministers to come out of that upper room, Peter, also encounters some begging. He and John are on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. And so they're walking in and there was a, a, a blind, uh, not a blind, I'm sorry, a crippled beggar that was always there by the gate that would beg as people would be going in and out of the church for money because this was how he made his living. And people were used to seeing him. He was used to being there. It was his spot in the road and here comes Peter and John and I love what Peter says to him in Acts chapter 3 verse 6 he says if you're expecting silver or gold I have neither don't you know that that guy was like we'll move on next it doesn't end there though what does Peter say to him he said but what I have I'm going to certainly give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth get up and walk. What happens? The man gets up. He walks. Everybody sees him walking and talking and praising God, and their mind is all blown. And where did this all happen? This all happened outside the temple. Later, we read where Paul, he begins to address the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and he says, have you forgotten that your body is now the sacred temple of the spirit of holiness who lives where? In you. You don't belong to yourself any longer for the gift of God, the Holy Spirit lives inside your sanctuary. <laughs> Table 19, your pizza's ready. Have we forgotten what's in us? Pastors, ministers, evangelists, missionaries, musicians. It's just a label. Underneath all that is just the temple. Have we forgotten? We don't have to beg God to do and bring us anything because God already brought us everything he already is. And I mean, the moment that spirit is on the inside of you, you have everything Jesus is and nothing that he's not dwelling on the inside of you. So the joy that was talked about last night is in you. The hope you need is already in you. The healing you need is already in you. Why? Because you're the temple. You're the house of Jesus. And Jesus doesn't show up empty-handed. I want you to know something. You lack nothing. There is nothing that you're going to need in this life that God hasn't already put on the inside of you. Don't be begging God to give you something he's already. Oh, God, give me a ring. Oh, God, give me a ring. And what he's saying, I've already put the ring on you. The robe's already on you. The shoes are already on your feet. Stop begging and start being. How much further would we be if we would quit begging and start being So that must mean there's fruit in us, there's gifts, that must mean there's direction. Oh God, please show me what I'm supposed to do with my future. I'm showing you, it's in you. <laughs> we, we, I, I think how God must laugh a little bit when he watches our services, that we spend so much time begging that we could be an hour ahead of schedule if we just start being. What if we taught the people God's allowed us to lead to just believe that they've already got it in them and they can just tap into it at any time? I don't know. I'm just figuring it out too. Maybe I'm the only one needing to figure this out. You guys may be sitting in here. Uh, this little chump, me. <laughs> why did nobody teach him that? Tell me. My wife and I were walking one day, and I said, do you realize how much further along we would be in this walk with God if we had been taught this as kids instead of being taught we were so awful that we had to beg our way into an experience with God? And every time that we disappointed God, God's spirit left us and was mad at us, and he was sitting there ready to just browbeat us to death. I mean, I had an image of God as this mean, awful thing. And here we are supposed to preach the good news, and if we preach that to our people, don't you know they're saying, why on earth would I want that? 
Why are our churches not full? Because the good news has been put out there with all these limitations of if you're not begging well enough, if you're not good enough, if you're not praying enough, if you're not jumping through the hoops good enough, you're not going to get what God has for you. And we've taught people this, and they said, thank you, church. I'll be back at Easter. And I'm like, Lord, forgive me. Help me to show people that they've already got what you have already given them as the sons and daughters of God before the foundation of the world. He chose us, and he chose us to be the house of his very presence so that everything Jesus could do on this earth, there's nothing we can't do on this earth because the very same power that raised God from the dead, raised him from the dead, lives. I'll shut up. Acts 17, 28. In him, we live, we move, and we have our being. Look at the passion of that. It's through him that we live and function and have our what? Identity. Ooh. I'm Gene Lashley's grandson. I have yet to grow a tomato like him, but I'm going to do it. Because it's in me to do it. The identity of this world is all kinds of confusion. Well, no wonder the church hasn't taught them their identity. They taught them how wrong they are. They already know that. But what if we taught them what was in them? Before the foundation of the world. I'm God's son. He is in me. He is with me. He is for me. And if God be for me, mm. so some of us in here today may be dealing with cancer. There may be a cell in your body that is not what God designed. But who else is in your body? Jesus. And He hasn't got no cancer. So we have to start seeing ourselves through his body. If Jesus isn't dealing with this cancer, then this cancer has got to go out of me because we are one. We are in union together. You can't separate. I mean, a man leaves his father and mother. The two are united to become one. That is the image of us with Jesus. We are one with him. You cannot find a separation where there's Taryn and then there's Jesus. No, it's to Jesus. Probably should put him first. Jesus to her. <laughs> Depression. Mm. Oppression. Well, Jesus is in me, and he's not oppressed, and he's not depressed. So why on earth am I allowing this to dwell in me? God, let your mind, which is already in me, take over my mind, which has already been down. Lord, I thank you for it. Where, there, where there's loneliness because of this thing called ministry. You've been stabbed in the back a million times. You trusted someone. You made a friend with them in the church, and then all of a sudden they know that you're real <laughs> and that you aren't just floating around on a cloud playing a harp all the time. And so then what did they do? They stabbed you in the back, and so I'm not going to trust anybody. I'm I'm not going to have any friends, but yet I've got this friend on the inside of me that the Bible says sticks closer than a brother, and he already knows all my failures and knows all my weaknesses, and yet he says, I'm here to stay. And so this weakness is not Jesus' weakness, so if it's not his weakness, it's not my weakness anymore too. I can step away from that. When there's a bondage in our life and we're being held in chains, what? Jesus isn't bound and held in a chain, so I don't have to be bound and held in a chain. Jesus isn't fearful, so I don't have to be fearful. Jesus isn't blind to what is going on in this world. So I don't have to be, I'm here to tell you we are one with the Father and we don't have to beg him for a single thing. All we gotta do is step into being and stop begging. And I'm just wanting to know, is there anyone ready to stop begging God to show up and start letting God who's already shown up do what he said he would do? Come on, give him a hand clap this morning. He's good for it. So, I don't know what you're dealing with, but we're the call response people. We don't just deliver a word and say, thanks for coming, see ya. But where are you? Hey, I still find myself before I even realize it. Lord, please, oh man, 
Sorry. <laughs> Our church is $1.7 million in debt. Lord, please remove this debt. And he's like, would you stop begging for it? It's coming. I've already supplied it. It just hasn't showed up in the bank yet. But it's coming. So I'm just like, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. You know, Life Church, it's got $1.7 million of debt, and it's going to be debt-free in Jesus' name. And then we're going to rip up our stinky carpet and have cool floors like this. <laughs> yeah. Lord, I thank you. You've got my daughter in the palm of your hands going to college, hanging out with some really, uh, I mean, people that I don't even know. And I've been in control and being able to guide her life all this time. And now she's out from dad's wing. And sometimes when I text her, she doesn't respond. And I want to go on my phone and find out where she is because I don't trust boys. Lord, you got her because you're on the inside of her. So I thank you that everything that you have and nothing that you're not is there. And so wherever she is and whatever she's doing, you're right there with her. And you're talking to her and you're leading her and guiding her. So I'm going to lay down, put my phone up, and go to sleep because I don't have anything to worry. Because you're not worried, so I'm not going to worry. We just got to flip the narrative and switch the way we've been. I mean, we have got to flip this thing around and bring it to our churches the way God designed it from the beginning. And when we do that, we are going to set at liberty those that are bound, even by religious talk. Here's 10 steps to freedom. No, it's one. He's in me. Here's 10 steps to breakthrough, and there's nothing wrong with steps. We've all done it because why? It creates series, and then we know what we're going to talk about for the next four weeks. Hallelujah. <laughs> Told my wife on the way here, I'm like, you know, this is my message prep day. <laughs> i got to preach Sunday. Anybody else got to preach Sunday? I don't have the message yet. Uh, t- <laughs> he was like, Taryn, I'm in you. I got it. Where are you in this? What is it you've been begging God for? I want you to know the answer's here. It's in this room because it's in you. And all you got to do is say, Lord, I'm not going to beg. I'm just going to be because you've already got it in me. So if you need healing today, would you just stand? We prayed this morning for physical healings to take place. Just stand. If you need a physical healing... Just stand. God bless you. I'm believing for one of my board members at home. She's been with us since before the church even started. And she's got a cancerous tumor that she can feel. And I'm praying that she will go to feel it and it won't be there. That happens. Because that tumor is not in Jesus. You need joy like was spoken last night. It's been heavy depression, oppression, sadness, loneliness, worry, fear, anxiety. None of that's in your Savior. Just stand and let's be for just a moment. Whatever you need from him that you found yourself begging. God, heal our marriage. Please heal our marriage. Please, please. No, 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 no. Lord, you put this marriage together. You're not worried about it, so I choose to step aside and not worry. What's behind is behind. What's ahead is ahead. But what's here right now is what you have designed and what you have worked. And what am I going to do about this? Lord, please give us a better board. Lord, please give us a better staff member. Lord, please supply the money. Lord, please uh, uh, don't let me get fired. Lord, please. And we're all this. No, 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 no. Just be. Just be. So right now, just with your eyes closed. change your dialogue with the spirit that's already in you for just a moment. You don't have to beg for it. It's there. Healing, flow. Flow right now. From the top of heads to toes. Open up cells that have been closed. Open up arteries that have been clogged. Open up, Lord, right now. Take heart can pain, that chest pain, gone right now. Anxiety, float off. Peace, flood like a river over my brothers and sisters. Just say, Lord, I receive it. It's in me already, so I just thank you. 
I thank you. I'm, I'm being, I'm being, my body's being healed. My, that knee pain right now, it's, it's just going away because your knee doesn't hurt Jesus. I mean, I know you only lived 33 years and here I am 47, so I've got a little more ear on you, Jesus, but yet there's no pain in your body. There's no difficulty in you. Vision for that house you are over and you're thinking, should I resign and should I walk away? Have I outstayed my welcome? Is there any reason why I'm be there? People, people have heard everything I gotta say. They look at me like I don't know anything and here I am leading and I feel like we're just pulling dead weight everywhere. Lord, I thank you. Those you call, you equip. It's all in you. Everything you need to lead that congregation, to lead that ministry, to step into new doors is in you. So Holy Spirit, right now, shoot through their mind an idea they hadn't thought of yet. Give them a glimpse right now in their spirit of where you're taking them and what you're going to do and how you're going to open that door and make a way where there is no way. Lord, let them see a picture of that check coming across their desk. Let them see an image of a new couple coming that's going to help lead that ministry. Let them see, Lord, how they're going to process transition without fear and without worry. Lord, I thank you for freedom coming, chains falling off because you're not bound, you're not wounded, you're not hurt, you're not sick. So we aren't either. We choose to not beg, but just be. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God praise today?